anybody get this reference, Rapper's Delight? Raise your hand if you get it. Okay, so it's like half. So Rapper's Delight is considered the first hip-hop song. It was written in 1979 by the Sugar Hill Gang. I would play it, but it's not my laptop. But um, if you want to look it up later, I bet you you'll recognize it. It's really recognizable. Um, anyway, I won't be talking about hip-hop. I'll be talking about writing a gem API or an API to wrap another API. Um, and um, so I work at MongoDB. I maintain the Ruby driver to the database. So if you used MongoDB with Ruby, it's the BSON and Mongo gems. The BSON gem handles the serialization and deserialization of Ruby hashes into um, BSON, which is the data type of MongoDB. And the Mongo gem is um, the network layer um, code that deals with wrapping the requests that go to the database and the responses you get back and managing um, cluster state, basically. So if you have um, a MongoDB cluster, it manages the state of that cluster and what nodes it has to talk to and all that stuff. So, um, and just for context also, um, you if you're a Rails developer and you've used Mon MongoDB, you've probably used Mongoid, which is the active record replacement for, um, for using MongoDB. That's not the Ruby driver, that's like one level up that deals with taking hashes and turning them into Ruby objects or data models. Um, the driver is actually like one level deeper. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, wrapping APIs because I think a lot of us, um, let's see if this clicker works. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of us have become API authors through one of two ways. One way we could have become an API author is uh, by um, being Rails developers and realizing over the course of, our, of time that our Rails application has become quite large and unwieldy, complex, and needs to be broken up into different components at our company. Um, and when we do this, we sometimes create gems to centralize business logic between all of these modules of the system. And so in building these gems, uh, we're building an API, essentially, something that can talk to different things. And we have to maintain this over the course of time. So this is internal at a company. And the contributors to this gem, to this API, are your colleagues, your future colleagues, your future self, yourself. Um, and so, so that's one way. And the second way that we could have become an API author is by building a gem ourselves externally in our free time and then open sourcing it and having putting it on Ruby gems and having people use it. So you may find yourself in either one of these camps. And um, what, regardless of whether you maintain your own gem, I bet you will at some point maintain some kind of API that wraps another API. So I personally had this experience where I was working as a Rails developer at a company in New York two years ago, or three years ago. I joined MongoDB two years ago, and I realized that I do zero web development now at MongoDB. And I, so in maintaining these two gems, I realized that the nature of my job had changed a little bit. It wasn't good enough that my code just worked and my tests passed. I had to think about the accessibility of the source code as well as how people can contribute to the source code. I had to think about the API and how people use the API, API, and I have to think about the API I'm wrapping, so the server API, and not just the current one, um, because MongoDB has business requirements for the products that it makes available that say that they need to support um, two versions back of the servers. So right now the server is at 2.6. I need to support 2.4 and 2.2. And so officially I support back to 2.2. But um, I actually also have to support back to 2.0 sort of unofficially. So you're wrapping all these Diff they're essentially different APIs sometimes, depending on what kind of feature you're talking about. And so my code sometimes becomes very complex because I have to deal with a lot of different cases. Um, so the point is <laughs> that uh, before I was a web developer and it was sufficient that my code just was serving someone with a browser and a mouse, but now that the code is exposed and it needs to wrap this other API that's always changing, the nature of my job as someone who maintains a gem or an API has changed to encompass a lot of other things. So now that um, my code serves other developers, what are these things that I need to think about? And what kind of expectations do these other developers using my code have? 
Um, so one example is uh, this, this gem is really popular. I bet all of us have used it at some point. I didn't want to put this gem on the spot and have the name up there. So um, it's not there. But it's uh, a gem that a lot of people use. It's a really popular one. And um, I put a quote that I found online. Someone said there was a really great gem. They really appreciated the contribution to open source. But when they looked at the source code, they found that, or when they used it, they found the API to be sort of obscure and not accessible. There was a lot of magic going on it. And it wasn't, um, it just wasn't really user friendly. Uh, but people use it anyway, and they appreciate the contribution. It's just that they, they have these other expectations for the code that they're using. And so when thinking about um, building an API and uh, what those expectations are, you might have felt these like two different conflicts as a API maintainer. So the first conflict that I personally have felt is that you're sort of torn between feature overexposure and idiomatic consistency. So feature overexposure is when you expose the underlying API in a sort of raw way and you let your user to almost interact with that API directly. And that means that the user um, doesn't interact with your API so much and usually has to go to the documentation of the underlying API to figure out how to, how to use it. Um, and then, so that's an extreme. And then the other extreme is idiomatic consistency. So providing um, a heavy level of abstraction on top of the underlying API to make your API as uh, idiomatic Ruby as possible and as accessible to Ruby as, as possible. So, so making it, reducing the number of surprises and making it as fluid with uh, Ruby code as, as you can. So, Exposing features provides greatest flexibility because you as a maintainer don't have to do that much to wrap the underlying API. And idiomatic consistency reduces surprise. So a Rubyist will expect to be able to use this underlying API in a certain way. So that's one conflict or one tension that you might have as a maintainer. And the other one is between you and users. So you want something that's easy to maintain. Um, and your users want something that's easy to use. And so this works sort of in parallel with feature overexposure and idiomatic consistency because uh, you, if you expose the underlying API, you basically don't have to do that much and you let the underlying API have changes over the course of time that don't require you to update your code. Um, and then if you have idiomatic consistency, you are making a contract with your users that I provide this API and I will maintain this API going forward as you use this code. So your users have expectations and you also want to be able to maintain the API with minimal effort. So to give you an example of the kinds of uh, craziness that goes on the Ruby driver in order to support basically four different versions of the server, because not only do we have to be backwards compatible, we also have to know what's coming up in the server and uh, what changes are going to be there. So right now, current version is 2.6. The next, next one is 2.8, and there are a lot of changes in 2.8. And in particular, there is this like, horrible part of the code for um, adding an authenticated user to the database. So this actually isn't even including the code that handles the 2.8 situation. And there's a long inline comment there. And I know that's basically a blog post waiting to happen. But <laughs> it's there because if people want to look at the, I think it, I'll talk about documentation later and how I feel about inline comments. But, um, so what's going on here, just quickly to show you like the craziness of this, is that I have this method called add user. And add user is what a user would use to add an authenticated user into the database. What it does is it starts out and runs this command called users info with the username that the user has provided, and it catches an exception. It looks at the code in the, the error code coming back from the server and looks in a list of command not found error codes because there isn't just one in every version of the server. They've actually changed between the server versions. So it looks in this list of command not find error, found error codes of which consists null also and uh, checks to see if it's there. And if it is, it knows that um, the command Right, yeah, so it knows that the command doesn't exist, so it has to fall back onto the legacy way to add a user uh, on the database, which requires actually just inserting into a special collection. Um, 
if that code was not command not found, it knows that the command does exist. So um, it can go ahead and check to see if there's user info in the response coming back from the server. If so, then I'm doing an update because that user exists already. Otherwise, I know I'm actually creating a user and I run this command create user. So I have a helper method called create or update user, which takes the kind of command I have to send with the user information. It does either an update or create. Um, so that covers like 2.0 through the current version, but then 2.8 also has this like wonderful thing that you can't actually run user's info unless you're authenticated as an admin. So I have to add this other clause that says if I got an exception and it's actually an authentication error, I have to tell the user that you have to authenticate as the admin before you can actually do this. Anyway, point is like this is just a simple method called add user that the user is going to use. But me as the API maintainer has to do all of this underlying shenanigans in order to have make this work. And um, this is a lot of work for me, but it's but I take on that responsibility because I don't want to expose the user to this craziness. The user should not um, with MongoDB you can have um, a replica set which consists of multiple servers and each one of those servers can have a different version. So depending on who is the primary at what time, you talk to the primary when you're um, you're writing to a collection. So I don't want the user to have to know what version the primary is and like what method they have to use in order to add a user, an authenticated user in. Um, that's something that I should handle as the API maintainer. So this is where this is this is an example of like the complexity that you would have to um, handle as an API maintainer. Um, but the cleanliness of the the over the exposed API to the, the user is really important here. So given these two principles or two um, conflicts between um, the the user, me and the user and flexibility and uh, idiomatic consistency, how do we know what how do we know when to do what? How do we know when to expose the underlying API? How do we know when to put wrappers? If you stick to a bunch of principles, you can maintain a balance between these tensions. And these principles um, uh, I like to talk about in the context of uh, user experience design. If you think about user experience design, and you say that API design is user experience design, you stick to UX principles, you'll be able to accomplish having a clean API for your users and maintainability and uh, the reducing complex complexity for yourself going forward as you maintain different versions of the API and also the the um, exposed API that you have for, for the users. UX design in itself, though, is um, sometimes I think like, sometimes we underestimate the value of user experience design. And um, I want to bring up a example of something called the UX fun experiment that shows uh, user experience design in another context and it's important for uh, stock prices. So for example, um, there's something in, uh, Someone's phone is up here and like buzzing. Sorry, I'm just gonna put this on the side. It's distracting. Um, all right. Okay, so the UX Fun experiment was uh, an experiment that a design firm in Toronto did between 2006 and 2007, where they identified ten different companies in the U.S. that they deemed to have superior user experience user experiences, and they were companies such as JetBlue, Apple, Google. They invested $50,000 in these 10 companies, and over the course of the year, the stock prices went up for every single one of those companies. Whereas this is not a very scientific experiment, they did gather some, make some conclusion based on this. They said that user experience design is directly reflected in stock price. So us Rubyists, we don't have a stock market, but we do have Ruby gems. And we do have popularity of, of gems as an indicator of whether or not the user experience is good. Um, one example is, uh, I think, so there's the gem HTT Party by John Unimaker that has a really good HTTP, a really good API for wrapping HTTP requests. And it actually replaced when it was created, like a couple, it's pretty old, so a couple years ago. Um, it replaced another gem that had a pretty poor API. And I think immediately, as soon as John Nunemaker's gem came out, 
It um, gained immense popularity on Ruby Gems. It became sort of the go-to wrapper for HTTP requests. And that's one example where um, the, the um, API of a gem really does uh, allow people to, allow the popularity to grow because people will gravitate towards that particular gem. At MongoDB, we really, really value user experience. So I am on a drivers team. We maintain officially drivers for nine different languages. We're about 22 people. And we are part of this bigger team called the developer experience team, which consists of documentation and tools, and I think sort of like our online education experience as well. And we, we, we think about user experience of MongoDB um, regardless of what the product is. So like any entry point to MongoDB that a user has, we think about and we talk about and we try to make that experience consistent across whatever product, whatever driver you're using, um, documentation included. And arguably the reason that MongoDB became so popular so quickly in the beginning was because the user experience was very simple and made it very easy for a web developer to become a DBA. So for people who have used MongoDB and have opened up the shell, what language does the shell use? JavaScript, right? And JavaScript is a language that um, a lot of people know, uh, just because we're all used to working with browsers. And the fact, I think, for in my opinion, I think the fact that the shell was in JavaScript was pretty key for MongoDB getting widespread adoption in the beginning, because it allowed web developers to just like use a database and like, open up a shell to a database really easily and write commands in JavaScript to uh, deal with a replica set, so like um, have uh, redundancy for their data. And um, we continue that in that sort of um, commitment to user experience and keeping it simple by having this team and sharing ideas across all of the entry points to MongoDB. So user experience design itself. How do we talk about user experience design and how do we um, identify some principles that we should stick to when we're maintaining an API? With user experience, you obviously have users. So it, you can't just like not think about your users and not uh, to try to characterize them in some way. Uh, you need to know your users and think about who they are. So in the case of someone maintaining a gem internally at their company for a system or for a Rails application that's broken up into different parts, your users are going to be your colleagues who sit next to you. Um, they're going to be future colleagues um, who, who don't work with you yet or your future self, um, yourself in next week. Um, these are your users, the consumers of the API that you're creating. If you're maintaining a gem that is open source, then your users are other Rubyists and people that you meet when you go to conferences or people you correspond with on IRC or on GitHub. And you need to empathize with them too, like think about their perspective and how they're using your gem. So specifically, some ways you can do that is uh, read blogs, use Twitter, talk to users, give presentations. One of the main reasons I really like coming to conferences is because I get to hear about different trends in the Ruby community, as well as hear about what you guys don't like, what you do like. Um, it allows me to think more uh, objectively about my work and not be so uh, so stuck in my knowledge of MongoDB and, and like gives me another perspective really on uh, writing the, the driver, as well as hearing about like what other databases people are using and why. <laughs> um, so yeah, it gives you another perspective and gets you, allows you to get to know your users. Um, and then, so once you understand your users, you also have to understand that by providing an API, you're establishing a sort of contract with your users and that they trust that your API will not break their application. And as you make updates and you use semantic versioning, you won't be breaking their their application or their code. Um, we So in using semantic versioning, we had an example last year that showed me the importance of maintaining, uh, using semantic versioning and not breaking users up. So we didn't do this on purpose, but we had um, exposed something internally in the, in the Mongo gem that we did not intend for users to actually depend on. And in a patch level version, we had changed the, I think the method signature or something like that for, for this one thing. And one particular user had another gem that was dependent on that, was calling this one method. And so when we released the new version, he became really angry because we had broken his gem. 
And whereas we didn't do this on purpose, and the method he was using really was intended for a was a private API between our classes, uh, his um, like his degree of disappointment with us sticking to semantic versioning was made us realize how important it is that you maintain that trust and that um, contract with your users. Involves super users. So we have a couple of clients who correspond with us pretty regularly. And anytime, right now we're building a new driver, actually. And um, this has been really useful for um, maintaining a, sort of a list of ideas for the design of the new driver and understanding what's really important to our users. If you have some super users, it's not really necessary to have hundreds of super users. You'll find that if with just three or five of them, you'll have a pretty broad spectrum of um, ideas and information on how to better the experience for users. When I say super users, I mean like have a list of a million. You can actually get 80% of the information you need from just a couple of users. So those are users, um, UX design concepts. I don't have that much time left, so I'm going to try to uh, do this pretty quickly. Um, there are a number of UX design concepts and, and principles if you talk to someone who's an expert in UX design, but I'm going to focus on three main ones. They are consistency, simplicity, and mapping. Consistency is um, the use of a symbol or a interface component or entry point into your API that appears in different places and maintaining a consistency between the uses of that symbol. So a good example of this is button colors. When you look at a red button, you can sort of guess as to what that, that button's going to do. Green is success, blue is information. Um, sticking with these, uh, this consistent use of symbols gives your users a sense of stability and um, allows them to make assumptions about your, your API without having to read all of the documentation. Second one is simplicity. So this is where um, there's, there's another like tension going on between you know a lot more about the underlying API than your users know and should know. So there's this, you have this desire to like expose a lot, but you also have to make sure that you're only exposing the necessary things to your users. So you have to make your API as lean as possible without, oh, again, like feature overexposure. And then mapping is um, the use of an interface component that allows your users to understand very easily what effect that interface component has on the system and giving the user feedback that whatever it was that they wanted to do has actually happened. So I like this example. It's where there are knobs for a stove. And on the top, there are just knobs in a, in a line. You have no idea which one maps to what. And then on the bottom, they're actually arranged in, the, in a way that reflects the stove. So you know exactly which knob, what effect this knob will have on the system, which is the stove. And you get immediate feedback, obviously, from turning the knob. So um, I tried to enumerate a number of things that I've learned in the, within each one of these principles. Um, and we'll share some examples from the Ruby driver uh, showing how to stick with consistency, simplicity, and mapping. So three consistency uh, considerations, four simplicity suggestions, and five mapping mantras. So consistency considerations. Consider consistent naming. So this goes for class names, module names, uh, method names, variable names. Uh, variable names are really important because when people look at the source code, they're going to want to understand what's going on without having to reference the underlying API documentation. Consistent style. We're using RubuCop for uh, making sure that we have consistent style in Ruby 2.0 in the new driver we're building. And what this allows us to do is make sure not only we have consistent style on our team, because we don't want one com part of the driver to um, exude the personality of one person versus another. And the other thing is um, we, when we have pull requests um, from people, we want people to use the same style that we have because people's style will wildly differ. And sometimes it's just a matter of preference. Um, but having something like Rubicop is really useful because you can set all these parameters and then make sure people are consistent with that. And consistent behavior. So um, one example of this is we have, uh, there are like two commands that you can do in the driver that cannot be done on a secondary. And uh, we had one of these commands at one point, like rerouting to a primary and warning that it was rerouting to a primary server. And then the other one was just raising an exception. So you have to make sure that like 
when you're raising exceptions for one thing, you're raising exception for something similar. Uh, this goes, uh, it's a pretty broad concept, but um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. So simplicity suggestions. Um, give classes a single responsibility. I think that speaks for itself. This is an example of the um, types of wire protocol messages you can send to the server. So the server accepts, I think there are like eight in total or seven. There's some modules in there too. But when I open this folder called protocol and I see one single class with the single responsibility to create and serialize a specific type of wire protocol message to the server, it's really clear to me uh, regardless of what my knowledge level is of MongoDB as to what each of these classes does. So try to make sure that you have um, like a very, cons a very uh, clear architecture like that that's really simple to understand for someone even just looking at file names. Hide implementation details. This goes along with um, not exposing too much of your knowledge, not exposing too much of the underlying API, making sure that you only keep the, the API that's available to your users as lean and useful as possible. So that's using like protected, private, only exposing attributes that you need to expose. And be frugal with helpers. So uh, there are a number of different kinds of indexes you can create with MongoDB. And this is where I had to make a choice as to whether or not I wanted to provide a helper for each type of index. But I realized that the types of indexes could change in the future. They have changed in the past. So it's much better to just create one method that you send in as a parameter, the type of index you're creating. It's not really a big deal for the user. And this is a choice where um, creating wrappers or something that's uh, like a helper is not actually helping anything. And design your API first. Um, this is a good exercise to do. So write some code, write an app, and it'll become really clear really quickly when you start writing code using your API, what you should be doing, what choices you should be making. Um, I'm going to skip over that because I don't have time. Mapping mantras. Monkey patching is mean. Um, <laughs> I, we had an example in the driver where I found this code last year that um, was, uh, it was a monkey patching lock on mutex and <laughs> really scared me and it was not a good idea. Um, I, yeah, without embarrassing a past colleague, it was just like really silly. And I think we could have done it a different way, but uh, you can use things like refinements or inheritance. I think a lot of the problems that you would be able to solve with monkey patching could be solved with um, refinements we can't use because we have to support back to 187, but, um, but things like inheritance will, and design will help you get around these problems. Side effects are surprising. Um, mutability, we think about this a lot. Like uh, instead, people will uh, sometimes run MapReduces, these sort of like long analytics jobs or aggregations in MongoDB and pass in ops that they've set somewhere. And you have to make sure that you don't mutate things like ops that they pass in. This is like a really good example of where uh, you could surprise a user by um, accidentally mutating the config that they've set in. So you have to make sure that you do things like duplicate when they pass in these, these um, variables. Requiring method chaining is impolite because you make your user's code ugly. Um, if they're going to have to reach into an object and access some other object that's related in some way, make sure you expose that through the API in a simple way so that they don't have to write something like that uh, that's uh, not according to the law of Demeter or a train wreck, I think, as Sandy Metz has coined. <laughs> Informative error messages are imperative. This is not a blog post. This is a error message from Mongoid. If you try to access a document with an ID that doesn't exist, um, it's amazing. It's like first you get the error, and then it tells you the problem. Then it gives you a summary. And then it gives you suggestions as to what you can do to not get this error again. There's actually a configuration you can set to not see this error and just return false instead. This, I think, like this is not only nice for the user, but it's also nice for you as a maintainer because you're going to get fewer questions on GitHub. You're going to get fewer questions through emails and all this stuff. Like the, the, the more you can give to your users in their moments of frustration like this, the better. And then documentation. I said I'd talk briefly about inline comments. Some people think inline comments should not be used and your code should speak for itself. I disagree, especially when you're wrapping an underlying API that could have different versions. Someone looking at the add user code probably does need that long beginning of a blog post in the method because otherwise you have no idea what's going on. And uh, we use yard for documentation. Readmes I think should be short and sweet. 
I don't think they should be tutorials. I think a readme should be like sort of an abstract. Someone's interested in your gem, they go to GitHub and they want to see why they should use your gem and maybe some uh, small examples of how to use your gem, use your API. I think uh, readmes uh, should be sort of the top level um, uh, simple information about your gem and then you can have your tutorials and guides elsewhere. So the basic conclusion is you have all these things pulling you in different directions. You have user expectations, you have your own um, needs to be able to maintain the API, you have um, the underlying API that could be changing, and you also want to provide a nice wrapper on top. And in order to deal with all these like opposing forces, I think the best way is to think like a UX designer, and that'll help you find the middle ground and the balance between all of these uh, tensions. And I know I'm out of time, but one thing I want to say is that um, anybody who was at Gogo, Goga Ruko last year, James Edward Gray II, gave an excellent talk on his experience as a programmer. And he said something that I thought was uh, really poignant, was that programming is easy, that anybody can program, but being a programmer is what gets you to the next level. So thinking about other people and your users is what makes you really a programmer, not just someone who programs. And I would love to talk to you about the Ruby driver if you use it. Thank you.